And it's um, because it's uh, three months after the last one and an unfortunate holiday date, I think um, large numbers of people have been confused about what, um, you know, about the people who come and so on. So I'm very, very glad you're here and would like to very heartily welcome you to this meeting, which is on um, the very important topic of Tudor Harbour, but it's a topic that we haven't actually addressed before as an association. And so I'm looking to a very lively and interesting discussion tonight, which is introductory to what I hope will be a topic we discuss again several times, I hope. So um, let me start the ball rolling by changing the agenda. When the Mayor um, apologised, when her secretary contacted me and said she might be late, we thought we'd put on um, uh, we changed the agenda around a little bit to put the um, canal wall stabilisation trials, which is a very important topic for us right now, to put that on first and then have to speak the second. But in fact, I'm going to change that again to start with. Um, oh, I should say. <coughs> Commercially, 
and has been given broad powers, including declaring PDOs, planning for PDOs, deciding development applications, carrying out economic development, coordinating the provision of infrastructure, constructing roads and fixing charges. The, um, that's a totally new and different, an alternate way to um, deciding planning and development in all of those regions than is given under the State Planning Act. Um, this is a comparison, very quick comparison between the Economic Development Act and the State Planning Act. When a PDA is declared, new planning controls immediately come into force. So the existing planning uh, forces, planning um, provisions don't apply. Uh, and what happens is that they develop a new interim land use plan. A declaration immediately changes planning rules within the declared area. Uh, specifically under the Act, there's no code or impact assessment. There's no state agency referrals. There are no negotiated decisions. There are no third party appeal rights. I'll just say that again, there are no third party appeal rights. And an applicant can only appeal a nominated assessing authority condition. So a totally different planning and decision making process than for normal um, development applications. Um, I'll leave that there, that's a lengthy legalistic um, intro, but I just think it's vitally important that when you listen and hear the um, descriptions of what's to happen, you understand that how it's to be assessed is with a totally different paradigm over here somewhere from the usual one we apply to planning and development um, applications in, in the um, area. So <coughs> let's start by introducing Steve McDonald, who is a director of the um, organisation called Redlands 2030, which has become a very involved um, organisation in explaining local planning arrangements and conditions, and we hope and really applaud you in 2030 um, organisation, Steve, for it being so involved and interested in conveying planning and um, uh, planning and local development decision-making processes to people that mostly do allow <coughs> involvement, in other words, third-party appeal rights. So what we're, what we're dealing with here is going to be a novel way and a novel um, project for them to comment on. So, um, Steve, I'm really sorry. I, did, I should have asked you for a CV and I didn't. But I understand, I know that um, Steve has been involved, a member of the, um, he was a planner, with the State um, Planning Authority when the new uh, what was it called? South East Queensland Regional Plan was introduced many years ago. Eight years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so he's very knowledgeable about planning provisions and the planning act. And I'm sure he has very elaborate views on Tunda Harbour. Please welcome Steve. <laughs> And he puts his head in and he says, do you remember me? And I 
didn't hear from quite, but he said, I was at the meeting the other day, and I asked you what are you, where you're from? And he said, what are you, where you're from? So I said, I was a surveyor from New South Wales. And he said, you should have told us, because we all thought you were a planner from Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> so when people introduced me as a planner, I'm a bit reticent to take that <laughs> Profession that is much uh, maligned, but perhaps uh, somewhat subverted. Well, I came to the Two to Harbour project in uh, not, not in, in 2013 with the first exhibition of a, a call for public comment into the plan. I just let that roll through. It was a uh, that was, it was a consultation plan. I find it just it just the really context of people that pick up things on on the talk to the slides. And then there was a consultation report prepared, and then in early 2014, there was another call for comments, this time on a draft development scheme, which was really just outlined. That draft development scheme was effectively a new planning scheme, a mini planning scheme, which in legal terms took effect from the day that was uh, presented. Now, comments were asked on that uh, document, and I defied most people in this room to even read it. It was highly technical. Highly what I call plan or easy document. I think even the deputy mayor may comment about that sort of thing. It was a very difficult document to read. As I looked closer, I came across the old eye source with some difficult, significant problems in that, in that development scheme. And what we lacked, of course, at the time was the technical documents to support it, because the planning for the statutory document that we were asked to make comment on. In my view, at the time, I think the project and PDAs, due respects to the uh, authority of those PDAs, were driven by a hyper uh, souped up state government that basically wanted to override the frustrations it saw with people trying to express their rights about development. So the PDA or the Economic Development Act basically overrides local planning schemes, it overrides local communities, it overrides We've heard third party appeals, it overrides property rights, and I'll come to that a little bit later. It's a very powerful tool, and while some of those issues might, some of those PDAs may have demanded that, they were underway well before the uh, Economic Development Act was introduced. So some people thought they'd get through it without that process. In my view, when the Council surrendered its planning powers to the State Government, actually gave the planning powers to the state government to introduce the PDAs, I think it was all downhill from there. And I say that it might have seemed like a way to break through in the nexus of problems that maybe people foresaw. However, a month or so later, the council actually moved unanimously and asked the Minister, the Minister of Economic Development, for a one month extension for community consultation which had been, by the way, started in, in like summertime in 2014. So the unanimous decision of the council was to seek a one month extension on the public consultation. The minister <coughs> refused that application, refused that request of the council. In my view, there was the sign there was something wrong with this partnership. Was it a fair deal when the minister refused to listen to the unanimous decision of the council that he was in partnership with? And on another front, at the time we asked and sought advice during the consultation period, what was the cost of the problem? What is the cost of fixing the Toonda Harbour marine facilities? To this day, we don't really know that answer. We do know the answer, the, the question though, or the answer to the question is now $1.4 billion as, as appears on websites and so forth. We really don't know the cost of fixing the marine and the transport problem. So we now have an answer, we still don't know the cost of the original problem. Now I have a range of concerns around the Toon Darwin project, but I'll just start with the three that I think probably are the ones that I think are most important. In my, way, in my view, it's the consultation process, which I think has a number of serious flaws. It's the poor planning, and I don't mean the statutory planning, the PDA scheme or that sort of thing, I mean the actual planning that underpins that. And thirdly, I think it's highly risky in a financial sense. The consultation process, in my view, fell short of community expectations. 
The information sessions were basically a one-way download, in a sense, from a planner on high. People, <coughs> the first uh, event I went to, people were marched about <coughs> 150 metres on a very hot summer's day. You would have represented the younger cohort of people, some of the people who walked out there. In the middle of the sun, we marched out to be shown an iPad as the answer to the question. And our iPad in sunshine was pretty difficult to see at the best of times. Never mind some of these people had never seen an iPad in their life, probably. However, that was the tool we were shown. <coughs> While the un unreadable development scheme, which I mentioned before, sat in the library, a number of people, myself included, but many others, sought access to the technical reports that underpin the PDA scheme. Most of those reports, as it turned out later, had been written in 2013. About a week or so after the, after the consultation period closed, the technical reports were released. But they weren't released in time for anyone to make meaningful comment on the technical aspects of the PDA. Now, a number of the people in the community, the local community, not just around the PDA, gathered together and we actually were able to get support from a number of key professional professions, professional organisations and professionals. These were landscape architects, architects, engineers, surveyors. <coughs> and they uh, put together a, a team of about 15 people who volunteered their time to provide advice on the PDA as they saw it. There was a pro bono effort, there was no money involved. They spent two days in the Grand View Hotel working and examining the existing scheme and working up some options. Some of those options are on the screen up here. And their views were pretty blunt. One, they felt the site was completely inappropriate for any sort of marina. Two, the scale of the development was out, well outside the existing development in, in, in Cleveland. And they basically couldn't see it would ever work. They put some other options together and those options form the basis of the report which is available on, online. Now there was a few cosmetic changes to the PDA scheme. 800 marina births became 400 marina births and the 15 storey buildings excuse me, were reduced to um, 10. When the technical reports were released of course the technical report supported a 400 birth marina, which was what the concession turned out to be. There was a last minute push poll, in my view, to try and uh, garner support, and uh, that was reported that the majority of people supported the redevelopment of Tunda Harbour. I think that's where we come, at, come adrift. I don't think anyone doesn't support the upgrading of Tunda Harbour. It's what the costs, the social costs, the community costs, and the financial costs might be behind, be, be behind that scheme. Tonight, it's probably suffice to say, in my view, the deceptive consultation process used as a springboard, used was a springboard to development, high-rise development in Cleveland. <coughs> and it's, using the PDA process, it's free from the normal checks and balances that most people, I can suspect here, most people expect to occur in planning processes. So this is a process which is exempt from all of that. The things that people expect, the rights they expect to be able to exercise in terms of development are not going to apply or don't apply to the PDA. Now Redlands 2030 maintains that the proposal is the result of some sort of preconceived outcome. And you may disagree. The history of the site though is littered with numerous examples of trying to get this development or a like development up. I'm told, media reports, that it went back 50 years. But in the late 80s, there was a group of people got together and collected 12,000 signatures from what is known as the Stir Petition. Someone might know what that means. I think it's <coughs> Save Tunders <coughs> Invaluable Resources. That petition was put together pre email and 12,000 names were collected in hard copy. And many of those people, as I have met since, still live in the vicinity. Now when they took that petition to the government of the day, they got a promise by the then uh, Premier, I think it was Michael Hearn, that this project will never go ahead. Now, like it or not, many of those people who were behind that petition feel totally disillusioned with government processes because
because what they thought was a word was broken. Now, contemporary planning, in my view, can be broken into three sort of components. It should be values based. And the values that matter are the values of the community. Redlands has a renowned community plan, which the previous council prepared, and the current council has endorsed. And the values of this community are well represented in that community plan. There are other aspects of measuring value. The values, particularly the current planning scheme, the planning scheme was in place from 2006, I think it was, right through to today, was vetted through community consultation. So it's a measure of the community values to this day. It's been, it was wiped out in terms of this site. So there's, there's at least those two measures. There are many other measures of community, how the community values might be measured, but they're the key ones that I've referenced just now. Second key component of the planning is it's got to be evidence-based. And that is just look at the technical issue. Let's look at the science. Let's look at the site constraints. Look at the financial constraints. Look at the economic constraints. Look at the heritage values. Look at the historic values. Look at the ecological values. Look at that. Those things are all available. There's heaps of research around. Some of the aspects on Tunda Harbour, of course, is that much of the site is under the one in hundred year surcharge level without a measure of uh, climate change. In many places in Australia, no one goes near it for development because it may well uh, be underwater in 100 years' time or even with a storm surcharge. The issue of the cyclones is people, for example, forget the impact of cyclones. But a, a tropical cyclone of Category 5, say, which would be a big one, would certainly raise water levels well over the current parkland of the Toonda Harbour area. And those, those instances haven't occurred very often, but they have occurred in the past. Some of the uh, natural, well, I guess uh, the obvious uh, constraints on the site, of course, are things like the Ramsar Declaration, which is an international treaty that Australia belongs to, protecting <coughs> the national wetlands and the places for the migrating birds, etc. I'm no expert on that, but it's a site, this is a site adjoining the Ramsar wetlands. It's a site that adjoins the Marine Park, which also had an extensive consultation process when it was approved. So the, I guess the next component of planning is the one where you actually look at those decisions you're going to try and make on a site and the impact of those decisions on other sites, but also the impact of other sites on, on the site you're planning for. Now in my view, the, dis the disconnect between the Toonda Harbour PDA site and the Cleveland Town Centre is just absurd. They're going to have a separate CBD, effectively, trying to be stand up about that's part of a kilometre from the other one. It's not a walkable distance. It's not easily related. There are some assertions in some of the planning documents that the, the, the development of Toonda Harbour and its commercial development will not impact on the CBD. Well, I don't believe just saying those things makes it happen. I don't see how you could possibly not impact on the CBD with the major development as proposed in the Toonda Harbour area. Also, the impact and the link to Stratty. Of course Toonda is the gateway to Stratty, and that's what it should be. But if we're going to put a tourism attraction, a tourism, tourism destination at Toonda, then people won't go to Stratty. So you're going to be having competing tourism attractions, one at Toonda and one at Stratty. The reconciliation of that is certainly not apparent. You can't just say these things and expect them to happen because it's in the plan. It'd be like fixing up weed problems in National Park by just zoning it weed free. You can't just say these things. There's got to be evidence. There's got to be a link. There's got to be some analysis. I don't know that, that how you, I don't know that you, you couldn't at least do sort of, sort of economic input output analysis on Toonda Harbour and the CBD and work out what the real impact might be on the, those businesses that are already struggling in the CBD. No point just making a statement that there's no impact. Now, the next issue, I think, of, of concern to the, uh, myself and Reverend Spring 30 is the financial implications. Mm -hmm. Now, this is sort of the driver of this approach using the PDA to keep the financial implications away from the ratepayers. And I love that objective, don't get me wrong. However, the, the financial implications of building a $1.4 billion centre 
on 67 hectares of land, most of uh, uh, flood prone, with high ecological values. A $1.4 billion residential, I think it's been <coughs> in the Walker Corporation site, as a, a, a coastal village. A coastal village surrounding a marine harbour with truck movements at the moment, I don't know what happened when they'll stop, but there's truck movements at the moment, car movements, there's car parking for people going to Toon to Harbour. People are going to try and live in a high uh, quality residential environment with truck movements every day from the first, first light to dark and during weekends and certainly holidays, thousands of cars trying to park in your environment. It just doesn't gel with me. Now, I think even the question of who should be paying for this marine, up, marine facility should be really challenged. I think there should be a proper discussion around the fact that the state government says it won't pay for the upgrade of Toondah Harbour and the, and the council has to pay for it. But who are the users of this facility? I would suspect the majority of people who use Toondah Harbour don't live in Redlands at all. Many of them travel from Brisbane and much farther afield to use Toondah to get out to Sprit Crab Rape Island. <coughs> So it's a user-based system, then the current ratepayers should not be paying for it. I think most of you will agree with that one. But, it, but as, a, as, a, as a access to a, a community of 5,000 people, the, count, the state government says we're not going to fund people with the road. I mean, we won't pay for the road to Ipswich or the road to the Gold Coast because it's a road. In fact, our road to Ipswich, to, to, sorry, to, to North Strap Road, happens to be water-based. And then for the government to say they're not going to fund the road to North Strap Road is absurd. But let's try and unpack, let's have a discussion around unpacking that very matter. Who, what about the, who are the beneficiaries? The PDA process actually uh, captures a number of freehold blocks. There's huge betterment involved in those upgraded up zonings, which is done to those people, not with them, to them. But their, 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 their development rights went up by perhaps three storeys. There's some, certainly some betterment there. <coughs> the businesses that already exist down at Tuta, um, driving their profit out of people taking people to the strap road, fair enough. But are they beneficiaries? So I think there's real questions that the state government should be put to the test about on who should be paying for this in the first instance. And I, I do think perhaps simply with the council to say that the, council, the state government said they'd do that and uh, come, no, no correspondence seem to give to. I do make one observation that uh, when the local member before the last election was calling for suggestions for infrastructure from the proceeds of the uh, sales of, of the uh, asset sales, he included the Dunwich Harbour as one of the infrastructure projects that could be funded from state money. But he didn't include the Tender to Harbour site. And why would he do that? I just don't understand. In my view, from a financial perspective, the council has not examined, or certainly not aired, the financial feasibility, the business case, the benefit cost analysis, and, who, and, and share those outcomes with the community. There was a report in, earlier this year of a due diligence test. That's fine, I'm glad it's done. But we don't know it. So as the ratepayers, as the investors in a sense in this project, we're kept in the dark. It's now nearly a year and since the Toon to Harbour process was announced we're going to have Walker Corporation building it, there is nothing that we can see that's happened. The employment opportunities seem to mainly exist in Melbourne where the Walker Corporation resides. I don't know of any local consultants with any sort of nous about it who have been involved in this project today. As I mentioned, it was over a year since the council and previous government gave this project to the Walker Corporation. They are a big organisation and they're very effective at projects which are perhaps unusual fits for people. They're very clever, I've got no doubt about that. In the last year, there's been no attempt to engage the community in the Toon to Harbour project, despite the ratepayers of Redlands being told that the major beneficiaries or the major investors. We do have the, here the project has grown to 1.4 billion, but I have to say, what was the question? 
What we were consulted on was probably a project about a hundred million dollars. A 1.4 billion is a 1400 percent increase in the scale of the project. It's not reasonable to take the consultation, even if you agree with it, from 2013 and 2014 and bring it forward and say that's the rationale, that's the reasoning, that's the excuse for a 1.4 billion dollar project. It does not gel. How are we going to time? I'm going to have to finish. In my view, the council will treat its community with more respect and particularly explain the costs, the benefits of this project and tell the community how it's going to be better off. Not just tell us, by the way, but show us the evidence. Share, us, share the evidence with us. Let us work forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, very much um, for that statement of um, description of the consultation process, particularly, uh, which I'm not fully familiar, and I suspect a number of other people are not. Um, and I'd now like to introduce the Mayor, who I'm very pleased to welcome here to speak on what is a very new and obviously controversial topic, Tuna Harbour. And we, I asked both speakers to do pictures. I said, please do um, PowerPoint or uh, illustrate your um, presentations with pictures. I think that's what the mayor is doing here. No, that's okay. Um, I'm very glad they both have because um, I think it's much more important and impactful for you to understand, much easier to understand when there's a picture to show and to remember. So now I'd like to introduce the Mayor, who you all know and recognise as, um, as our next speaker, who I assume will be arguing for the development of Tunda Harbour. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Chair, you are right. Um, I will be arguing for the Tunda development. It's got a bit of a um, reverb on it. Yes, do you want to try speaking? It's very good for a yodel, but not so good for speaking. Um, I might just speak for that. Can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, don't use it. No, I'm sorry. I think it works well. Thanks, Randall. Good evening, everyone. And I'd like to acknowledge the local councillor, Craig Ogilvie, the other councillor, Bob Lowry, also Deputy Mayor Alan Beard. And I've got a couple of candidates, I think, in the audience as well this evening, Peter Mitchell and Karen Owen. Uh, to Steve, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to go in front, uh, face to face again today on this particular topic, which is uh, really why 2030 came to be, I believe. But um, let me just also say that, uh, you know, don't shy away from the fact that Tuba Harbour is a game changer for our city. And I just wanted to probably clar clarify a couple of points that have been made, Srinka, and they're all, they're all, everything that's been said in, in reflection of the Economic Development Act is correct, and there are 23 PDAs. But in fact, the, the, there's only a few PDAs that are established under the actual Economic Development Act to date, and some of them were mentioned. So under the previous government, they actually combined, combined two pieces of legislation. It was the Industrial Development Act of 1962 and the ULDA uh, Act to create the Economic Development Act, which created e Economic Development Queensland. In fact, Turner Harbour and Wyoming Creek were the, were the first two of three to come about, and I can say that probably there was lots of learning that came out of the ULDA, but they saw some of the opportunities of that to fast track particular developments that had economic development potential for communities in the state, and also difficult sites. And it's fair to say that Turner Harbour has been a difficult site for half a century. And we've heard about some of the uh, attempts over that, that period of time to make it happen. Part of the issue has been that the state government hasn't taken responsibility, as Steve has said, about the fact that we have a port that services uh, Morton Bay, uh, south, uh, southern Morton Bay, in the case of Wine Creek, and of course North Australia Broke Island uh, in the case of Turner Harbour. And councils have all had to look very creatively how we can fund the dredging of those, those areas over a number of years and have to wait a long time. And in fact, some of the providers, some of the ferry companies that have been um, referred to this evening are often knocking on our doors to make sure their businesses can continue. So that was a dilemma that councils has, this council and other councils have faced. In fact, the previous council saw the, the need for Turner Harbour and purchased $7.5 million worth of land in that area so they could be a driving stakeholder in a solution to Turner Harbour. So uh, 
as I said, I genuinely believe that Toonda Harbour will be a game changer for this city. The $1.3 billion redevelopment that the Walker Group will deliver, uh, should it get the further required environmental and development approvals, because it's not over yet, but what we'll get was a world-class a world class ferry terminal, a public marina, and a deeper harbour to accommodate those various transport options that I've just been talking to. And for say today, I actually, um, the reason I was going to be late is that I had some uh, relatives from Perth come and visit, and we went for a bit of a drive around Redlands, and I was astounded to see the lineup of boat trailers here at the VMR. It was packed. It made Johnny Depp look pretty insignificant, really, young when he was here. Similarly, at my to point, and I know that uh, Councillor Boglari has issues down there all the time about accommodating boat trailers. The reason that we are a destination is that we have this amazing foreshore, but our access is limited. And we have few opportunities with what we have in Redlands now, in built form, to actually deliver those waterfront opportunities. And Turner Harbour and One Creek are probably the last two that you'll be able to deliver to actually give that access to foreshore. On top of that, as I said, there'll be a multi-million dollar promenade. There will be a dining and retail precinct and hugely upgraded open spaces. And, and Steve spoke about that more and more, and I'll elaborate. But we need to be on the map. We're an aging population. 60% of our community leave our city every day to work. What are we going to do to keep those people in jobs? What are we going to do to provide those people who will be out of a job when the cessation of mining occurs in 2019? This isn't a silver bullet, but it's it's a step in the right direction to do just that. And I actually believe, and I think Steve touched on that, that it's not just going to be a transport hub and Gateway to Morton Bay, it will be a destination in its own right. It's proposed that it will deliver a thousand jobs per annum over the next 10 years, <coughs> about 500 to 600 jobs thereafter. And as uh, we're all aware, not everybody in this room is going to be enthusiastic about Toon Harbour as I am. But I do know the majority of residents in this city are absolutely keen to see it happen. In fact, yesterday when I was at the Relish Festival and I was walking around, forget the push polling that was referred to, people stop me in the street and they say, when's Turner happening? And unfortunately, I can't tell them it's happening soon enough, but I have no doubt with my radar of being in this job for 12 years, and I'm sure the councillors in the room will agree with me, that people want to see something happen at Turner Harbour. What's the reason? It's because we want to have access to our foreshores, but more importantly, we don't want to have ratepayers funding what is the required transport facilities for the second largest sand island in the world, which is relying on tourism as part of its economic future. The number of people that have told me their entry to Tuna Harbour is enough to make them turn away and go back home is sad. Because we know once you get on that ferry and you get over to North Strabrack Island, you've got one of the most idyllic paradises in the world. And yet, yeah, that's our entry. So there is lots of reasons why we needed to find the way that was going to have the least amount of impact on you as ratepayers and deliver that, those pieces of infrastructure and enhance those foreshores. And if it wasn't for the Economic Development Act, we'd still be talking about what are our chances. So I'm very relieved that we have an Economic Development Act and we've forged a relationship, not only with the previous government, with the current government. So there is bipartisan support for Tudor Harbour going ahead. And uh, albeit that you don't have all the details at this point in time because there is a lot of commercial unconfidence, as I said, Council purchased about $7.5 million of land because they wanted something to happen at Tudor Harbour. And I can say that, very hand on heart, that is a really good deal for this city. We will actually make money as a community out of Toon Harbour. I can't tell you exactly what that is, because it is commercial and confidence. But we have had BDO do their assessment, secondary assessment on financials, and I can tell you that the majority of the risk does not lie with the ratepayer. Right the majority of the risk lies with the Walker Corporation. And in fact, we've taken a conservative view of that assessment. So just until that information can be made publicly available, rest assured that you will get a return much, much greater 
than seven and a half million dollars. And then you've got to add to that, of course, the rate of income that council gets on top of that. Plus the hundred million dollars the community will receive in its new infrastructure. So there's common arts, a transport hub, all of those things which are designed to be built up front will be invested in by the Walker Corporation and paid for by the Walker Corporation before you even see a unit built. And of course they'll also pay on top of that the, prov the provision of infrastructure charges like any other developer in the city. So all those things add to the return on the investment the council made for the seven and a half million dollar land purchase. And you all know that right now there is no project more desperately needed than turn to harbour when we face a three and a half year cessation of mining on North Stradbroke Island. And clearly the Queensland government is pushing ahead with that. So we, we actually need to make sure if tourism is one of the opportunities moving forward that we enhance this side, the big puddle, to make sure that people are attracted to go across. And if I could just add that, you know, it's not about trying to stop people at turning to harbour. We've had discussions with the part of Kayak, the Indigenous people, the opportunities for cultural heritage to be prominent at Toon the Harbour to in fact encourage them to go over to North Stradbroke Island. And bearing in mind that without a world-class transport hub and arena, you've only got two operators, you don't have the tourism opportunities for the various uh, you know, day tour boat rides across Morton Bay over to Peel Island or to North Stradbroke Island because you've only got those two operators going back and forward. This is an opportunity for this to be a water-based tourism destination for tour operators as well. And of course, I, I believe also that the Walker Corporation see this, uh, the end of mine, to be an opportunity for them to talk further with the state government as to what they can do to bring that on. So, while everybody here has the right to criticise the project, that's your right as a ratepayer, that's 2030's right as a, a political lobby group, what we need is a viable solution. And I haven't seen one yet, frankly. I haven't seen one that doesn't impact the ratepayer or deliver that waterfront infrastructure that this city cries out for on days like today. So just talking about some of the alternative proposals, because as uh, Steve mentioned, they did come together with a group of professionals and they had a two day workshop at the Grand View. And I just wanted to elaborate, these are some of the plans that they came up with that they've published on the website, so if you can't see it tonight, you can probably find it. So you've got this, this particular one here. And then, uh, so this is the working harbour. And this one here, uh, you might recognise this area because I think that's where most of you might live. <laughs> so, so let me just talk about that a little bit if I could because albeit I think it's a great opportunity to look at the alternatives. Our council and the state government sought to deliver something that was commercially viable and would have the least amount of impact on our ratepayers. So after this master urban design workshop, um, the working, you see the working harbour and the boulder option. Let's just talk about that a little bit. The alternative proposal wouldn't be viable because we started out wanting to fund the required infrastructure at Toonda Harbour. Now the figure that we've got is around $80 million to build those promenades, to build that transport hub. So that's what the figure that we needed to cover for our investment and our time in this particular project. For any of the developers in the room, and I know that there's at least one, you know to have a viable, a viable product, you have to have a good space. Because that's what makes and breaks the financials of any particular development. That's why a lot of people want to live waterfront or want to develop waterfront because it's probably a unique and probably an asset that's declining in its accessibility. So the proposal identified, as you can see over there in the pink, at the western side of the PDA boundary. Can you see that over there? Sorry. Oh, you've got there. I apologize, there we go. That saves me having to. Thank you. Is the other one there? Yes, which one do you want? No. I'll come back to this. I don't think that works. I'm not going to see so the residential area is actually surrounded by a car park, I think, uh, on the western side. Uh, and in their workshop notes, they reported that commercial activities were ruled out completely. Page 15 says, forget retail, 
it would kill the center. That's, I think that's kind of it, but you can see there's the car park. And the price they set on this particular alternative was a 10 million plus model. Sorry, it's so okay. I was asking Chris to scroll down to show that it's not there. It's all good. We'll, we'll leave these out, you can have a bit of a close look later. So the price they said in the workshop was a 10 million plus model, but we've never have delivered the significantly more required millions of dollars to develop to deliver the 80 million dollars infrastructure that we've talked about, which includes the transport, includes the basin, includes the bison channel, and it includes improving that foreshore area. It's critical that we deepen that harbour, because as you know, that bison channel, it, it does actually sort up quite often, and, and it does so sort of prohibit those very operations to operate in a sustainable fashion. So let, let's forget those elements. It, it also doesn't have the opportunity of delivering you know, thousands of jobs. So if we use the Queensland Treasury model of how you actually work out how many jobs you'll get out of an investment in this particular type of project, this development would have delivered 30 jobs. It's hardly worth everyone's going out on the planet's limb to do that. Let's look at the bolder option. This option would be fraught with lots of difficulties. Firstly, the option proposed to move the impact of development to a less degraded environment. So compare Toon Harbour to Rugby Bay Foreshore Park. What area needs more upgrading? I would suggest it's Toon to Harbour. Secondly, if it, uh, it proposed development right along the area's most rich in history in Cleveland, which is that little historic precinct and included over several historically listed buildings. Most importantly, it would have channeled all the traffic down Mast Head Drive. I don't think um, too many residents in this room would have been happy with that outcome. So let, let me get back to Turn to Heart because that's what we're here to talk about, the proposal that we currently have happening. It's really clear to me that the consultation, as I walk around Redlands and I hear people talking about it, they're thrilled about it. Yes, we have to get it right. And yes, there's still a lot of work to do. What they want to see are the coastal promenades, a central plaza, dining and retail precinct over, overlooking you know, that beautiful asset of North Fairbrook Island. I don't know if anyone went down to Raven Harbour this weekend, Raven Bay Harbour. You can hardly get a seat in a restaurant. There is demand for that in our community and beyond. And it's great to see people coming to visit. And I'm thrilled that the visitors come to Redland um, and get to discover the wonderful assets we take for granted most days. They also uh, got the cultural and tourism benefits that could come from the model that we're currently working through. Like a world-class convention centre, and I know Castle Bog Lowry is really keen to see first-class visitor information centre in our city. There's the opportunities. An in independent survey commissioned by council, which I think might have been referred to as push poll, um, and run by market facts, also showed overwhelming support by the residents for an upgrade to Tunda Harbour. Another key finding of that particular push bowl or <coughs> was that overwhelmingly they did not want rate payers to fund it. Most importantly, Walker's Group's preliminary proposal for Toonda Harbour has been assessed by third parties, and I mentioned BDO earlier. It's reviewed the financial proposal and Oricon's reviewed the engineering proposal. I wanted to talk about the fact that we did actually use a Queensland based and Walker Corporation has used Queensland-based consultants. In fact, Dikey Richards uh, popped a bit of a um, bit of heat over their first initial concept that they put out. They are a Queensland-based company that was used to put forward the first uh, elements of a concept. So this means that Walker's Group's proposal and its underpinning economics has been tested by a third party. It's been proven to be viable, whereas these options are completely untested, and they did start out with the same terms of reference that we set out, which was to make sure we could deliver this particular project without impacts on our rate payers. Just quickly, if I get an opportunity for an update, because I'm sure you want to hear what's that, because most people ask me that question. Council's been meeting with Economic Development Queensland every other week. They obviously now need to progress what we call a development management agreement, uh, which underpins this program, uh, project. That's because we want to make sure that the right piece of infrastructure is delivered at the right time, with the least amount of financial risk to the community. It's a very important document, and we're hoping we'll see that shortly. The state government is also moving ahead with its plans to identify the relative native 
native title holders. Obviously, that's a very important milestone for them to, to get through because it yet hasn't, hasn't yet been extinguished. And I think you might see some advertisements about that in the coming months. So have a look out for those. Also, by the end of 2015, I expect the concept master plan for Toonda Harbour to be out for consultation with the community. In its first stages uh, of the environmental impact statement, um, and you'll also then get to see it through the development application submission. So there's plenty more opportunities for you, and I encourage you all to be involved and engaged to have your say on this development. Up to three times, in fact, you'll have another opportunity to put forward your thoughts. So just probably now touching on a couple of other things that were mentioned. Uh, consultation was significant. It went through two processes uh, in the initial stages. Firstly, we had a deliberative phase as we came together as a community to go, what do we want to see here? And Council actually reported back on all of the existing studies that informed it, and such as um, the Southern Morton, Southern, Southern Morton Bay Interrated Local Transport Plan, in particular for One Creek, our knowledge of the current constraints. Uh, and we did this to demonstrate the Council had listened to what the community had wanted in that area. We also then had a statutory phase, which I think was also touched on by Steve. This ran from the 10th of January to the 24th of February. It included five community forums, five community mail outs, advertisements in local and state media, and stakeholder meetings. This process engaged about 2,000 people. So all in all, it was about 10 public events and about 20 stakeholder meetings. And I think it was touched on, we listened to the community when they came back and we did take on board their concerns. We reduced the number of stories from 15 to 10. We also reduced the marina from 800 to 400. And of course, there was a lot of uh, discussion at the time about the dog park, about GJ Walter Park and the impacts on that, albeit that it was actually in that concept plan that that park would stay. We went further and we, we made sure that there was constraints around GJ Walter Park that it would not be impacted. It's great, so we established a great protection with the state government for GJ Walter Park. We also, um, we also were asked about uh, public open space in the PDA. And we, look, we know that's a priority. I mean, it was demonstrated today, people wanting to get access to the bay, they want to have that public open space on the water. And of course, this is one, as I said, one of the most important opportunities we'll have in a long time. <coughs> we want our visitors to come and enjoy Redlands and its foreshores. Uh, and I can say that With the, with the Toonda Harbour foreshore, earlier this year when the new state government and the Deputy Premier came out to announce their support of Toonda Harbour, that Peter Sarbo, who was the representative of Wharf Corporation, actually said to the community publicly, you'll actually have more than four times the amount of public open space that is currently there. So that is certainly a win for our community. I just thought to uh, Quickly, just also while I've got the opportunity, touching on city plan, which is a different process as has been it sits under the Sustainable Planning Act, it's completely different to the Economic Development Act. Uh, it's really important that you have your say on that. I know that George has already raised some issues with some of the storm, storm tide mapping, and I encourage you to put forward your submissions. I also want to sort of encourage you to understand that Council has been told by the State Government that we are required to accommodate 50,000 people uh, in this city up until. 2041, and we're doing our best to, to contain that. Obviously, this will help by having a number of uh, residents at Toonda Harbour and Wine Creek. And um, that consultation will end on the 27th of November, and I encourage you to get online and make sure you know all about it. You, there's various pop-ups happening. There's been one at the library. Uh, this is one element of planning. This Toonda Harbour sits outside of that, but it's an opportunity for you to be engaged. So that probably, um, that probably, allow some time for further questions if you like after speakers Rika. But I, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening, particularly on a long weekend. Uh, hear a little bit more about it. I ask you to keep your eyes open. There will be a further uh, consultation. Just remember that this process has to get federal and state government approvals, both environmental and development approvals. So currently they're going through what they call the EPBC Act, which uh, touches on how they protect the Ramsar area, which is what Steve was talking about earlier. So it is quite a thorough process. The, development, uh, the developers have to go through four seasons to make sure that those impacts across a 12-month period 
are all addressed and there will be no impacts on that. Uh, so please keep your eyes open, we're looking forward to your feedback. Uh, Zrinka is absolutely right, you don't have third party appeals, but at the same time, if you want this to happen for your city, this is probably the only opportunity we've had in a good half a century. So once again, thank you for your opportunity. Thank you very much, Karen. Can I now invite questions, please? Yes, George. Um, this is probably to Karen. The uh, requirement uh, for this city plan, can you hear me down the back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The requirement for the city plan is established by the state government on their flood mapping. Um, I've got a real concern about the proposed flood maps that they're using where there's nearly a metre rise in sea level and on top of that there's greater storm surge than we've ever seen before. I'd just like to ask the, the question is what protection are we going to have if they build this Tuna Harbour complex against the possible erosion? Uh, and it might only happen once, but a bad erosion could wipe out half of the, the new establishment. Are we then going to have to pay the cost? Because if government are recognising that this is a potential threat, remember, for all of you who haven't seen the, the city plan, the whole of Raby Bay is flood prone, and as is Cleveland Point and right down to Tuta Harbour. Um, so it's whether we agree with the facts or not, they're the facts we've got to fight with. And if erosion and storm surge becomes the big issue, it could do an awful lot of damage to new projects down in that area. And all I want to know is, if it does, having identified that you know it's going to happen, are we going to pay for it? Well, firstly, um, like any development, they have to meet all those criteria and not have to provide studies that have to be assessed as well. Uh, we've learned a lot out of Raby Bay, believe it or not. Raby Bay, you know, I was only a, a young adult when it was built um, and clearly <coughs> to talk about the issues that we've faced as a community with Raby Bay. Uh, my understanding as far as the process going forward with Toondah Harbour would be a very different setup to Raby Bay. In fact, things like the revetment walls won't be owned, they will be owned privately. Uh, there's talk about the opportunities for body corporate uh, processes to make sure that access to the uh, marina, etc., are maintained. But the state government and the federal government uh, will be look, look, looking over those environmental issues, and the state government will certainly be taking into consideration, as will council, the storm, storm tide issues, as we do with any development. Steve, yeah, yeah. go ahead. I, I just think some of the mathematics of this exercise don't quite stack up in respects. The Mayor said that there was an 80 million dollar costing to do the uh, marine, marine works and the bridging of the harbour. Now, if the project's now worth 1.4 million or 1.39, I think is the kind of word figures, but we'll have that order. And if you allow 400 million now for the works that are needed to fix the harbour and dredge the harbour and all those things, there's still a billion dollars missing. Now, my rough figure says at 250 grand a unit. There's 4,000 units of apartments to go into the harbour. I could be wrong, those figures are all a bit mystical. But it's of that order. The Mayor mentioned that the, the, rating, the infrastructure charges are capped like any other development. There's a gap between the capped infrastructure charges and the cost of infrastructure. Steve, funding is a funding issue. A lot of questions are responding to the funding. So the, the cost of the infrastructure and the capped infrastructure leaves a gap of about between 80 and 100 million dollars. So how are we going to be better off? We might as well build the heart for ourselves and not take the chance and then keep the, some of the other facilities. Did you say 250,000 dollars for a unit? Where, where do we find up for that? The construction costs. So just, uh, as can I respond? That's fine. Uh, look, just very quickly, yeah, very quickly. I would, I would appreciate, I think a lot of people have Going to have a lot of questions. Yeah. So if we could do well, that, it's a very, maybe it's a very important question. I'm, glad I'm, I'm very glad that Steve raised it. Actually, okay. So well, let's just be very, really, really clear. Firstly, we're talking about a 1.3 billion dollar investment. Um, as I said to you, there will be a return to council, and council's not the only landowner there. So is the state government. In fact, they're a bigger landowner. So I think it's it's a bit premature to establish a, a cost per unit and work out where the gap is. BDO 
is an accounting firm with international experience. They've looked at the figures. Let me make this very clear. We took a conservative view of their figures. They gave us a couple of scenarios. From their point of view, the risk sits with the Walker Corporation. So what happens if Walker Corporation goes broke? Well, the development management agreement will allow that to come back to the state and council to manage forward. I can, I can assure you without being able to give up the commercial and confidence issues, we don't take this lightly. We've done our research, we've had third party information. It's the best offer this city has seen for a long time. On the capital infrastructure charge, there's a bit of a furphy there, with the greatest respect to Steve. And there is a big argument about infrastructure capping, and yes, it annoys me that the state government has stopped subsidising water and wastewater in the local government, and they have capped infrastructure charge. So let me be clear about Greenfield versus Brownfield. Areas that have already got infrastructure, like Turn to Harbour, will not have the same cost of delivering infrastructure, will not require the infrastructure charges that you might require, for example, uh, in the area approved by the previous council of Kinross Road and South East Thornlands. So I'm, assur I'm just assuring you that on top of the fact that this pe these people are taking financial risk up front, they're building infrastructure up front, the council will also be able to uh, collect rates and the infrastructure charges, which probably are as a bonus in the Brownfield area to a Greenfield area. It is not a concern to rate payers at this point in time. And obviously we've got to go through that development management agreement and lawyers have to get that right. Uh, but my, my view is that we haven't seen an offer like this and I'm sure the councillors in the room that have seen that will, will agree with me. Thank you very much. Now, could, could I please? Since could I, I please? Can I, can I just, yeah, Christa, since Karen yes, mentioned the councils in the room, I think, it's, I think it's fair to point out that BDO modelled a range of different scenarios, financial scenarios. Some of them are positive, some of them, as you would expect, are negative. To say that there's one outcome and it's all positive, I think is a little bit overstating it, to be honest. Sure, but we, we still took a conservative view. We didn't take the. No, there's a, there's we didn't, no, no, that's not true. There's, there's a. There's, there was a range of there was a variance analysis done on uh, sales prices and on construction costs, and according to what the variance analyses were uh, predicting the various outcomes, um, then you know there's different outcomes. Some positive, some not so positive. So I don't think it's, it's just not fair to say that it's just you know a, a black and white. It's going to be positive. Uh, outcome for us. It's, no, and there's a lot of water to flow the bridge before we know whether it will be or not. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. what the Mayor is saying is that there are professionals who do cost benefit analysis right. and who do scenario planning who are actually doing the, um, the what would you say, the, 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 the analysis that is the latest technology, if you like, for doing this kind of assessment. For us to actually do conjecturing now about you know how much an apartment would cost, um, you know, is far less important in my view than knowing how much the update, the upgrade to the harbour is going to cost yeah. and who's going to pay for it. Yeah. And if there is to be a contribution from the developer, that's very significant in my view. That's the information I'm looking for and that would form, in my view, a very important part of the cost-benefit analysis that has not yet been done. This financial one is only part of that. Right. Yeah, uh, the costs the and the benefits are also going to include missed opportunities and co obviously environmental costs, social costs, community costs, the, many of the things that um, Steve has raised. They figure, they all get included, but then they also estimate the benefits, the economic benefits. And because this is a decision to be made under the Economic Development Act, the economic development principles and gains are the ones we have to figure and estimate first. Yeah. And they're the ones that count most. Yeah. I guess the point I'm making is that there are still further studies that need to be done. Oh, yeah, and, yes. And, and, and let's just not jump to the conclusion that this is going to be a big sure. financial And I want to say, I invited Peter Saba, the you know, Queensland Operations Manager of Walker Corporation, to come today and have quite a bit of correspondence with him. And he, um, he said, no, sorry, we're not ready. But he said, we're really pleased that you're interested and, and want to be consulted, and I'd love to come to one of your meetings in 2016. So I've got, um, I've actually got that in my report, and I'm going to ask you to tell me whether you think we should invite him to come, and then we can quiz him. Yes? Sir. Yeah, uh, my name is Martin Hayes, I live in the Navy Bay, and I'm, my background is uh, hydrographic surveyor. Martin, yeah. do you mind using, can you hear Martin? Yeah. 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 Now, every 
I've worked all around the world in different parts, and you always, without fail, do a siltation survey at least a year, maybe two years, before anything happens. I assume someone has had that done already? There have been hydrological studies. And no, hy no, not hydrogra hydrographic. So hydrographic. No, yes, yeah, siltation. Yeah. And tidal streams. Yes. Because someone is going to have to pay for those in years to come. Taking Raby Bay, we're all paying for what wasn't done years ago. Now, um, I bet, I, I could almost bet that there isn't any uh, siltation survey on paper that any of you have seen. And what does that mean, Martin? Well, it means it, to see how, how long... We need to have that done quickly. So yes, absolutely. It should be done today. Yes. It should be done because if it takes, say, six months to silt up a part, who's going to pay for that when all the, all the buildings are all completed? Oh, uh, And okay. there should be groins that, that should be set out into the water. Can we take that, make a note of that? And actually suggest to the mayor and the council sure that, 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 that that's the question, one of the well, questions we like to ask. Yeah, so it's quite a paradox to have a real substantive problem. Yeah. Do they? And it's costing, the next period is going to cost them something around $10 million. Okay. So someone's going to have to pay for that later. Yeah. Sorry, George and then um, Danny Bird. Danny and then Sam. Good question for the mayor. Um, has the state government seen a lot of football people into the um, Redlands area? Have they um, given any indication of putting in the expressway corridor that is on the map um, and whether that's going to be implemented at all within the next 10 years? We're talking about the Long Street through Palawa. Um, this is part of the frustration of local government and certainly something that um, myself and other members in South East Queensland argue is that it's okay to have a regional plan, and of course Steve worked on that regional plan, which is about proposing how growth is accommodated in the region, but what they need is to have an associated infrastructure plan. The previous government actually pretty much put that completely off agenda. Um, it's certainly it's something we're banging the table about with the current, current government. If you're going to have growth, you have to have infrastructure, and it's something we struggle with. But to put into context, Redlands is getting 50,000 people, Logan's getting 300,000. Um, the whole region of South East Queensland will grow by about two million. So there has to be innovative ways of delivering infrastructure and if I could just say that you know this not, might not be the perfect science, um, however being able to get private investment to build things up front in this instance is an opportunity we should be exploring across the board and certainly something I'm keen to see us do things differently and that's the infrastructure charging regime currently does not cut it. State government, federal government does not invest. I think councils get about 4% of the total revenue across the country. State governments get about 16% six, uh, federal government get the rest of the, uh, the taxes revenue from, um, from us as a nation. It's time they started building infrastructure that like, drives the economy as well. So, but that's a, quite a, a long winded answer, but it's, it is an issue that we continue to fight. The thing is, if we don't plan for growth, it doesn't mean they won't come. You sort of like Redlands has grown organically like that. You have to have a plan for it. Uh, it's, you know, it's either a fail to, fail to plan or plan to fail. Benny? Yeah, thank you, Chip. Uh, no, <coughs> my voice, I think we'll work with that. From coast, from coast, yeah. yeah. Probably. <laughs> um, you spoke earlier, and I'm just wondering is this conversation just holding the sides to do with Tudor Harbour, or we've got to make a call here? Well, I prefer to have questions on Tudor Harbour because that's what we've been with discussing and if you do have something vitally important on the city plan for instance which I'm going to raise later in the meeting um, I'd prefer to actually take it in writing and on notice if you don't mind. Uh, just because we're both about about the traffic down here on oh, the weekend okay. because I've taken some photographs on my camera um, pad and um, one of the problems we've got here of course it's love to death down here and all the trailers and the boats uh, trailers and the cars are, are parking down over here in Crossway and Little Shore Street. And of course, Mayor Williams knows already we've got a problem with a, 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 a 12 three story block of home units built here in the park. And uh, it was quite frightening on the weekend. You, you, you're flat out getting in and out of Cross Lane. And they're going to use Cross Lane as an access 
you know, these 12 or three storey high rise buildings. Mm -hmm. And we've had discussions with council and with Mayor Williams, and it's an abomination. It's an abomination. And uh, the cars then started to park on the, on the vacant block of land where Old Father Nolan's house used to be. And maybe that might be the answer to add. We don't need to worry about Doomba Harbour to that extent as far as parking cars and, and trailers. Right here, you've got something already sitting there in your face. The other thing is too, I'm just wondering, has anyone done a survey at RQ to see how many boat sites are up for sale over there? They're not exactly bursting at the seams and waiting for a site to come up. So we're going to spend so much money with Walker Group on 400 on the boat uh, facilities down there when at RQ they're, they're screaming out for people to buy their site. So I'm just wondering how far all this has gone. I'm sure it has. But I was mainly concerned about the park here and, and the other house. Danny, can we offer to write down your concerns sure. in a letter and address them formally through the association if you wish to the mayor <coughs> the council asking, telling them about this problem and, and, um, and see, because I think a, a quick response now probably might deal with it as well as a considered response in a letter. Is that okay? So after the no, meeting... No, 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 I, I appreciate the time that you've given me. Yeah. I, I get a bit scared when I see that map up there with that. Uh, and I don't know what all the squiggly bits are, it looks like something from a <coughs> kindergarten thing. But I've been worried about that part at the top there before you go down. That wasn't, that's not council's version, by the way, so... I'm just a bit worried about, about what we've got there because it scares me. What, what's all that about? Well, maybe 2030 can explain. That was their little um, two-day two workshop where they proposed, I think, some further development at, um, out there. <coughs> I think it's uh, fair to say that the people who put that, that diagram together were one of three groups who worked on that project pro bono. The diagram shows working essentially in a planning sense working from the whole to the part. You don't start with the tune to harbour issue and just plan on that site. You've got to plan the whole of Cleveland and the whole of that, that urban area to achieve an outcome that may involve, I could be wrong on the figures, 4,000 units and 10,000 people living on the bubble on the end. The Mayor spoke of the option and the impacts that this would have on the people of Rugby Bay. And I accept that. The people of Rugby Bay would be affected. As are the people around Toonda Harbour going to be affected by the project we have in front of us now. But can I just so say just that, trade off the just before you go any further, I actually live in, well, I'm going to say something, this is a rainy, I'm Dave Trevor, this is a Rugby okay. Bay ratepayers meeting, yep. and we seem to be off the focus of the Rugby Bay ratepayers. Now you talk about non-consultation. I live in Masthead Drive. You've gone and drawn this up there. Where's the consultation with us? You've also talked about